my uh, my program is Trial by Treasures, Arthropods of the Ancient Seas. And I actually have an exhibit that's 3,500 square feet. And it's uh, in the uh, Cranbrook uh, Museum of Science down in uh, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. I just installed that uh, a couple of days ago. And it's got over 250 actual specimens of the 20 some odd thousand that we actually do have that have been identified so far. So I got a long way to go. Uh, trilobites are arthropods. Arthropods are creatures that have jointed legs. Uh, arthropods are things like uh, spiders, uh, centipedes, millipedes, crabs, lobsters, things like that. They have a hard exoskeleton and jointed legs, so they are a member of that group of animals. They lived from about 550 to about 250 million years ago. They died off at the end of the Permian extinction when pretty much 75, 75 to 95%, depends on who you talk to, of life uh, died on Earth uh, during that extinction. They lived in the ancient warm, shallow saltwater tropical seas that uh, covered uh, much of the Earth at that time. Uh, they have a very hard exoskeleton, and that's why we're able to find these creatures, because soft tissues don't fossilize. Hard tissues are what actually fossilize, and the shell of the, uh, the the carapace of the trilobite is what we usually find um, as a as a fossil. Uh, very first creature on Earth that actually had eyes, very primitive eyes, kind of like a fly's eye. And you know when you try to swat a fly, uh, chances are he's going to get away from you uh, because they have such great vision. We think that, the, again, the, uh, the trilobites had fantastic vision. Sometimes they had really spectacular spines uh, coming back from the head section, coming back from the tail section. And we'll see some of those in a little bit. And again, their closest living relative on earth today is, is the horseshoe crab um there were 11 orders and i'm some of the stuff i this is a program i use for a college and adult programs so some of the stuff i'm going to kind of gloss over but there are over 20,000 different species of trilobites have been identified so far and actually every year we're identifying more and more uh, they're one of the most diverse uh, group of animals on Earth that ever inhabited the Earth because there were so many different types. Uh, they vary greatly in size and shape. Uh, they range in size from anywhere about an eighth of an inch to almost three feet long. Um, and again, their size and shape is, is really, really uh, diverse. Some had spines, some didn't have spines. Some had two spines, some had 57 spines. A very, very diverse group of animals. Um, and they're really kind of easy to collect in the areas where we do find them. Uh, we do find uh, quite a bit in, in certain parts of the country. We'll talk about that in a little bit later. Uh, here's a, a diagram that kind of shows you the, the age and evolution of trilobites. They were at their peak during the Cambrian period, so much so that the Cambrian period was called the age of trilobites. And you can see how many different orders we have at the bottom, uh, just lots and lots of different kinds of trilobites. And from there, the family tree kind of grew. But as it grew, we found less and less of the, uh, the different uh, families of trilobites until one uh, emerged in the Permian period. And and at the end of the Permian period, that one group uh, is just gone. There are no more, no more trilobites. There are creatures related to them. Spiders are still here. Uh, scorpions are still here. Uh, insects, uh, crabs, crustaceans are all still here. But trilobites uh, have long been gone. We call them trilobites because they have three distinct lobes, a central or axial lobe that runs right down the middle of the creature, and then two plural lobes, one on either side. So that's where they get the name trilobite, three lobes. But it's also divided three ways horizontally into the cephalon or the head section, the thorax or the body section, and the pagidium or the tail section. And generally the, the head and tail are solid shields where the thorax is individual segments. And those individual segments have the ability to move just a little bit. Uh, and we'll see why, why they can move in just a little bit. So basically it's divided three ways horizontally, three ways vertically. These things are trilobites. The underside of the trilobite is where all the soft tissue was. Uh, that's where um, the legs and gill branches were. That's where the mouth was, the antenna. Uh, they had a mouth called a hypostome. And basically what they were, in my opinion, is they were the vacuum cleaners of the ancient ocean. They would suck up the decaying plant and animal matter at the bottom of the ocean. And that's how they would feed. Mostly a scavenging type creature. Um, these creatures did have lots of legs. Uh, every one of the uh, main thorax uh, section, sections uh, of, the, of, the, of the body <clears throat> had a pair of gill branches and legs. Now, we know what these guys look like because of some of the evidence that we find. Uh, 
we're actually able to find some soft tissues that have been uh, preserved. It's a very rare occurrence. There's only a couple places on earth where we actually can find these. One is in New York, um, in uh, right near Rome, New York. They have a lot of pyrotized trial bites. So what happened was they died and sank to the bottom of the ocean in very anoxic conditions, which means there was very little oxygen down there. And as these things rotted away, the organic matter, the soft tissue, was replaced by iron pyrite. A lot of iron compounds in the water, and as they rotted away, they were replaced by iron pyrite. So now we can actually see what the soft tissues look like. Um, here's an example of some of those pyrotized trilobites. We've got um, the antenna. We now know that trilobites had antenna. Uh, the bottom uh, right-hand picture right there is a gill branch and then one of the legs. And you look at the leg and you can see it's got jointed legs, jointed appendages. If you look very carefully at an insect's leg, that's what they look like right there. So these things are related to insects. Uh, so again, we've got some of these soft tissues that have been fossilized. And uh, we can tell what the creatures look like. So today we can actually see those creatures and reconstruct them the way they would have been when they were alive. <clears throat> the trilobites broke, broke up into several sections. The head section, again, was normally a solid shield, but it did have uh, suture lines in the section. And suture lines were areas of just a little bit of weakness. We've got suture lines in our heads as well. The suture lines in our skull actually hold the different plates of the skull together. Same thing happened with trilobites. But the suture lines in trilobites would also aid them in what we call molting, uh, shedding that exoskeleton. And some of those other parts at the bottom there, those are some of the uh, different parts of the cephalon that help us identify uh, different species within the group of trilobites. They all have different types of uh, head sections, different types of genal spines, different types of glabella, and that's what helps us identify uh, which trilobite species it is. Trilobites had eyes. They had very primitive eyes, kind of like a fly's eye. And it, there are really three ma major types. The first one, the holocroll eye, that one had up to tens of thousands of little lenses. Uh, the abathocroll on the other side of that had sometimes as few as two or four lenses. And then the one in the middle is the one they usually had. Now you can imagine again with all those lenses and their eyes were kind of crescent shaped. So when you look at a trilobite's eyes, that crescent shaped eye with all those little lenses there, he probably had really good 360 degree vision uh, as he scurried around on the ocean floor. Again, try to hit a fly with a fly swatter. They have a good chance of getting away because they can see you coming a long way away. So trilobite eyes are very specific uh, to each individual species. And some of the eyes had as many as thousands of lenses, some as few as two or four. So uh, their eyes also are a way that we can uh, determine different species. This photograph I just put up there basically to show you all the different parts of a trilobite that help aid in classification of that creature. Um, Again, we classify animals by, by their size, by their shape, by different parts of the creature. And it, this just helps us to, to classify those animals right down to different species level. Now, another way that we classify them is by the size of their tail section, by the size of their pygidium. We've got four major kinds. One is called a micropygus. And a micropygus pygidium just means the tail section is much smaller than the head section. We've got a sub isopygous trilobite that has a, a pygidium or tail section just a little bit smaller than the head section. The isopygous trilobite has a head section and a tail section that are almost identical. The only way you can tell the difference from the front and the back is the front's got eyes on it and the back doesn't. Uh, and then we've got the macropygus, and the macropygus just means that the tail section is larger than the head section. And this is another way that we can classify trilobites. Now, trilobites, because they had a hard dorsal exoskeleton, had a, a, an ability to enroll or protect themselves from danger. Now, danger, there was a lot of danger back then. Uh, most of these creatures lived in the ancient tropical oceans. Normally, uh, they were down around near the equator where it's nice. We got nice warm tropical oceans today. But the storms that we get down there are called hurricanes. And hurricanes don't just stay on top of the water. They churn up the water as well. So we believe that sometimes these trilobites could roll themselves up into a little ball and roll around on the bottom of the ocean until that storm is over. 
They also can protect themselves by rolling up from other predators. Uh, some predators would be able to, to get at their soft tissues and, and uh, bite them and eat them that way. So by rolling into a ball, they protect themselves in a nice, hard, uh, round sphere. Um, so again, protection from the elements and protection from uh, predators. Here's an example of what trilobites would look like if they were enrolling. They would take all their soft tissue, their legs, their gill branches, their antenna, and they would tuck them up inside and roll into a ball. The front or the cephalon had a little notch in it, and the tail section had a little bump in it. What they would do is that head section and tail section would notch together to create a complete sphere of protection. So they actually lock into each other, the head section and the tail section. Now, there's a, a couple of different kinds of enrollment. First of all, there's a sphere, spherical enrollment where they roll themselves up into a little ball. But there's other types of enrollment with the uh, spiky trilobites, with the uh, uh, trilobites with spines, that was really quite unique. In the middle there is a Delmonides trilobite. These come from New York, and they've got a very small nose spike and they've got a very long tail spike, and they've got two really long genal spines. The genal spines are the ones that come back from the head section and go back towards the tail. So when this guy rolls up, you can see that diagram right there. He's kind of really pointy. He's got a really big point up, uh, up towards the top and two big points at the bottom. Um, at the, the bottom picture right there on the right-hand side on the bottom, that's a, a green ops trilobite, and he's got a lot of spikes on his tail, two spikes on his head. When he rolls up, he looks like that guy right there. So now let's think about today. Out in the, the lakes and rivers and streams and even ditches, there's a creature called a stickleback. It's a little tiny fish. Then the stickleback has three spines that stick up from his back. Well, here comes a pike or a perch or a bass. He's really hungry and he sees that stickleback. He sucks that stickleback into his mouth, but the stickleback, he doesn't want to die. So he sticks those spines straight up into the fish's mouth. The fish cannot swallow him. So the fish spits him back out. Stickleback goes away and does what he ever wants to do. And the pike or bass doesn't get a meal. We think the same thing happened with trial bites. You can imagine if a fish came by to suck him up and try to eat him, there's no way he would be able to get him down his throat. And these guys lived during the Devonian period, and the Devonian period was categorized by fish. They actually called it the age of fish. Fish were the dominant form of life in the Devonian period. So we can see that the trial bites could protect themselves by those sp spikes and spines. The fish could not s physically swallow those trial bites. So enrollment was really an important thing for trial bites. Um, to, to survive. Now that last picture just popped up. That is the only one known on earth that looks like this, that, that we actually see that enrollment. We've never found any others like that. And I'm proud to say this guy is in my collection um, uh, in the museum uh, here in, in Michigan. So again, trial bus had that ability to enroll to protect themselves from danger. Now, because they had a hard exoskeleton, they needed to molt or shed that exoskeleton. And what they would do is they'd split by the head section or they'd split by the tail section and crawl away and do whatever it is that they would do until they got hard again. Uh, again, they had to get rid of that or shed that exoskeleton. Um, in a former life, I worked at a family center. I was a director of a family center, and we had an aquarium in there that I filled with uh, local fish. There were sunfish, bluegill, uh, perch. Uh, we had snails in there. And one day we found a crayfish, so we threw the crayfish in there too. And we didn't want the crayfish to starve, so every day we would throw a worm in there. And we throw the worm in and you can see the crayfish with his antenna. He could feel that disturbance in the water. He walk up behind that worm, grab it with his mandibles, tear it apart, and he would eat it. Well, we did that every day. So he got lots of food. Well, as he's growing, he, he can't grow because that exoskeleton is holding him inside. So in order for him to grow, he had to shed or mold, molt that exoskeleton. Well, one evening before we're ready to go home, uh, he's in the aquarium and he started his molting process. I said, everybody, come back in tomorrow morning. We'll see his exoskeleton on the bottom. Well, we all came back in the next morning and the exoskeleton was gone. What he had done is he turned around and he ate that exoskeleton because he needed the minerals from that discarded exoskeleton to make his new skeleton nice and hard for protection. So while he was away from his old shell, he grew just a little bit 
And as he grew, that skeleton started to harden up again. And then he continued you know, you know, doing whatever he was going to do. The picture on the top right, you can see there, that's a, a, a trial by called him Elder Jobs. You can see very clearly the head section is broken away from the body and the tail. This guy had actually molted. This is a, a molted trilobite. Uh, so again, they had to discard or shed that exoskeleton in order for them to grow. <clears throat> the spiky trilobites are kind of interesting. We believe that the spiny ones, what they would do is they'd back up. They'd keep backing up until they dug those spines into the mud behind them. And then as they kept backing up, they would arch their back, and that would create that separation of the uh, uh, of the sutures. Then that trilobite would crawl away, crawl up underneath the rock, and, and get his exoskeleton hard again. Because while they leave that exoskeleton, their body is very soft. That would make them very vulnerable to any type of creature wanted to eat them. Um, and again, this, the, the way to protect themselves is to get that exoskeleton hard again. <clears throat> we can actually tell some of the different growth stages of trilobites. Um, we can tell the babies from the teenagers from the adults. The first picture on top, that little tiny blue thing on the far left-hand side, that's called a protaspis. That's the first stage of a trilobite. Um, we believe that trilobites hatched out of eggs. So the first stage after it hatched is that protaspis. And that's basically a very, very miniature uh, head section. That's all it is. There's nothing else there. Um, then the, the first time it molts, first time it sheds its exoskeleton, it actually gets a tail. And that's all it has. Then every time it molts after that, it adds one body section in the middle until it gets a full number of body sections of that different species. So again, we can kind of tell what stage they're on uh, at by looking at their at their body sections. Now that doesn't mean the first one is one year old and the second one is two years old. That just means that's that stage that they're in because if they have a great environment, the temperature is perfect, they've got enough food, everything is great for them, they're gonna molt and grow faster than if the temperature wasn't great and they didn't have enough food to give them nutrition, they would grow much slower. So it doesn't tell us how old they were chronologically, but it tells us what stage they are in uh, in their growth patterns. This is a great example. This is also in my collection. On the bottom left-hand corner there, you see the tip of a ballpoint pen. And that little round thing right there is the head section of a trial by called a paranopsis. That's all it is. That's the protaspis. In the bigger picture on the right, in the middle, you see an adult. In the Paranopsis trial bites, there's only two middle body sections, a head, a tail, and two segments in the middle. So the guy in the middle, that's actually the adult. To Down to the lower left, that's the protaspis. And then up to the upper right, that's a teenager. He's got a head and uh, a body section, uh, a tail section, but no body section. So again, this can kind of tell us what growth stages they were on uh, at any point in time. <clears throat> so there are some really big trial bites out there. Uh, one that was recently discovered is the Isotelus rex. Uh, he's 28 inches long. He was found in Canada. Uh, we've got one in New York. It's a little bit smaller than that. That one's called a Teratasmus grandis. He's the one that's kind of in the middle there. He's got a lot of really spiky spines on him. Uh, down the bottom left-hand corner is the Isotelus. Uh, the state fossil of Ohio is actually Isotelus maximus. And that one grows to about eight or nine inches long. That's as big as that one gets. But again, you can tell that, you know, these guys are varied in size and shape, growing anywhere from about an eighth of an inch all the way up to 28 inches long. So uh, very, very diverse creatures. We find them all over the world. Um, a lot of them are coming out of China right now. Unfortunately, uh, China has kind of cr clamped down on exportation of, of their national treasures. They call these things the national treasures. Um, so really, if you go out right now to a rock show and you see things being sold from China, chances are pretty good that they were uh, smuggled out of China because, again, they're not letting letting stuff come out. Um, and that's kind of the way a, a lot of the countries in the world are starting to go towards. Uh, we've got a lot of trilobites down in Australia, really great, wonderful bugs down there. Uh, the Volchow River near St. Petersburg, Russia, uh, a lot of great stuff coming out of there. 
Um, the trilobites up there are very diverse. Uh, they're usually preserved as golden calcite on a white, uh, creamy white colored um, matrix made of limestone. Uh, the Czech Republic uh, in Europe, a uh, tremendous place for, for trilobites. There's over 1,500 different species found uh, just in a very a small area, about a two, 300 a square mile area. Um, up in England, we're finding trilobites. In Germany, we're finding some of those trilobites that are piratized. We find some of those in Hunsrück, Germany. Um, Morocco, be careful. Moroccans have learned how to fake trilobites. Um, the Moroccan trilobites, when you see them in a store, they're beautiful black color on a gray matrix. Uh, be careful. Um, what they do is they've got molds that they've made and they can actually pour acrylic um, that's been uh, had little powders added to it and colored, and they can actually make lots of trial bites. When you go to Tucson, you'll see some of these Moroccan dealers have tables and tables and tables of almost identical looking fossils. That's because they are identical. They're, they're made. Now, every fossil has some repair or some replacement. That's fine as long as they tell you that. Uh, but if they tell you this is 100% beautiful fossil, eh, don't believe it because it's not true. Fossils are, are rocks. They're, they're, they're millions of years old. There's going to be some damage. There's going to be cracks in them. Uh, filling a crack is not a problem. Gluing something back together that is broken is not a problem. But faking it completely sure is a problem. Down in Bolivia, a lot of great stuff coming out of there. And then United States. Oh, my gosh. We've got a lot of great locations in New York and Ohio where we find a lot of fossils. We've got some here in Michigan, not as many as I'd like, but we do have some here. Oklahoma, Black Cat Mountain, produces some fantastic trilobites. The Burgess Shale up in Canada, uh, another location where we do find lots of soft body creatures that have been preserved. Very rare and very expensive when you find those soft body creatures. Uh, Utah, there's a place in Utah called Udig. Uh, you guys are close to it. You can drive out there and and um, for a fee, you can go digging in the rocks and you can keep all the trial bites that you find. It's a great location. I was out there 20, 25 years ago. It's a wonderful site. You're going to find a lot of fossils there. Um, Nevada, there's a couple of places in Nevada that are pretty good. Uh, and then California, we also do find trial bites in California as well. So these things are found all over the world. We haven't found them in Antarctica yet because uh, there's still a lot of snow and ice in Antarctica. But as it's melting, we have discovered some really cool fossils. We discovered a dinosaur in Antarctica. Uh, we call him Cryolophosaurus. Um, back then, Antarctica was much closer to the equator than it is today. So Eventually, we will probably find some trilobites in Antarctica as well. Now, predator versus scavenger. Um, again, most paleontologists believe that the trilobites were scavenging creatures. With a mouth on the underside of the body, that makes a lot of sense. They don't have a big mouth that they can grab something and eat it. However, some trilobites would probably act a little bit like that crayfish that I had that worm that was squirming in that aquarium, sending out vibrations that they can pick up with their antenna. So again, if a trilobite was walking across the bottom of the ocean and he sensed the vibration of a worm there, he could come up behind it and using some of those um, mandibles and some of those uh, appendages, he could grab that worm, tear it up and feed it into his mouth. So yeah, they're not gonna pass up a meal, but for the most part, they were uh, probably uh, scavenging creatures. But there was a specific species that was a predator. Um, this was a Carolinides. These guys, if you look at them carefully, they're actually swimming upside down because their genal spines, the spines that come back from the head section, are actually really high. Well, his legs can't reach the bottom of the ocean with those big high spines. So this guy actually floats in the water column, and he was probably a plankton eater. Uh, again, this guy had no means of, of locomotion on the bottom of the ocean. He had to keep swimming. Um, there's no way he could walk on the bottom. So again, he was probably one of those plankton eaters uh, swimming in the water column, and that's how this guy would eat. So yeah, this guy was probably uh, a, a very predatory uh, trilobite. 
Now, trilobites also ended up with diseases. Every creature, every plant, every animal on the earth um, sometimes succumbs to some form of diseases. Uh, plants have got, uh, you know, leaf rot. Uh, animals have uh, uh, genetic uh, problems, genetic abnormalities, or they get infections. Those things happen all the time, and they happen to trilobites as well. The first picture on the far left there, um, that is a tiny little spine. It's a genetic abnormality with this, this, this trilobite. One spine is way, way smaller than another spine. This is just the way it happened. It was a genetic abnormality, uh, something that was, was uh, not quite right. The picture in the middle, that trilobite on the right-hand side there has got a really rough edge. That looks more like uh, some sort of an infection got in there. The exoskeleton became infected, and it, it ended up with that rough outline shape. Uh, some sort of infection got in there and destroyed that part of the exoskeleton. The two trilobites on the far right, uh, top and bottom picture, those were actually bitten by predators. The one on the top has got a big chunk taken out of his side, but he didn't die because we see at the end of those sections, they're kind of rounded off. Uh, if he would have been bitten and died, you would see a, a you know, pretty much pretty geometric breaks as the exoskeleton broke. But we don't see that. We see rounded edges of those uh, of those segments. That tells me that he was bitten. He didn't die. He kept living, and his next molt. There's no body anymore in those one sp that one spot. So instead of growing a shell over nothing, they just rounded off that segment at the end. So basically, they just kind of healed themselves by rounding off the segments. So again, this guy was attacked by another creature. He didn't die. He just rounded off those segments next time he molted. Same thing with the guy at the bottom. The one at the bottom has got two of the body segments, uh, central body segments missing, at least part of, partly missing. And you can see how they're rounded off. So again, this guy didn't die of this injury. Uh, he lost the edges of those two body sections. And next time he molted, they just rounded off just a little bit. So trilobites did also suffer some, some catastrophes. Trilobites, like all fossils, tell stories. If you know what you're looking at, it's like you're opening the pages of a history book that teaches you what this what happened to these creatures. There's a place in Sylvania, Ohio, and also Cincinnati, Ohio, where almost every trilobite we find is found rolled up into a ball. They're found and rolled for protection. Again, remember, at one time, these areas were down by the equator. We have lots of big storms in the equator. Um, so as a hurricane came across the water, it didn't just stay on top of the water, it churned up that water. But it didn't just stay in the water, it hit the land. When it hit the land, it picked up a lot of mud uh, and clay and sand and just created a big slurry. And that slurry washed into the shallow lagoons where these creatures lived. Now, the storm is you know, raging up there, so they roll into a ball and roll around on the bottom of the ocean. Then all of a sudden, that slurry comes in off the land, that mud flow, it comes in and it covers up those trilobites. It covers up, it covers them up in lots and lots of sediment. So now they can't unroll themselves and get up to the new bottom of the ocean. They die underneath all that mud rolled up into a tiny little ball. So most of the ones we find in some of those locations are found tightly rolled up. Now, some we do find that have kind of opened themselves up a little bit, but again, there was too much weight and they couldn't unroll completely and get to the new bottom of the ocean. So they died partially enrolled or completely enrolled. Now, the trilobites in Middleport, New York, we find them flat, upside down, and pointing northeast. Flat, upside down, pointing northeast. There's something going on here. We need to think about that. Well, trilobites love fresh, clean water. We know that because they're closely related to lobsters and crabs. The Chesapeake Bay um, has a crab that lives in it called the Chesapeake Bay Blue Crab, one of the best tasting crabs on earth. But as time was going on, they were catching fewer and fewer crabs. And they thought it was because of overfishing, but it wasn't. It was because the water was getting polluted. They realized that and they stopped polluting the Chesapeake Bay and all of a sudden the blue crabs started coming back in record numbers. So that tells us that they got to have fresh, clean water to survive. Up in Canada, there were a lot of volcanoes and when a volcano erupts, it throws a lot of volcanic, volcanic ash into the air. And you know from your science classes that anything that's heavier than the air falls back down to the earth. So that, that ash starts to fall back to the earth. When it hit the water, 
It poisoned the water. It changed the pH. And it made that water unlivable for these creatures that loved fresh, clean water. So they died. And they sank to the bottom of the ocean. But they sank to the bottom of the ocean upside down. How is that possible? Well, the top part of the trilobite, the dorsal part, is heavier than the underside. The underside has just a bunch of legs and gill branches. So when it died, it flipped upside down and sank to the bottom. Just like if you put peanut butter on a piece of bread and drop it, what side's going to hit the floor? Peanut butter every time because the peanut butter side is heavier than the other side. It's going to it's going to sink to the bottom upside down. Now they're all pointing northeast. How is that possible? Were they all swimming in the same direction when they died and sank to the bottom of the ocean? No, that's not possible. Every major body of water has a current. And what happens is the current flows over these trilobites. It starts to tumble them. And it tumbles them until they orient themselves to the path of least resistance, which means their nose is pointing back into the current. They are very hydrodynamic. If you look at that Arctanaris on the right-hand side, he's got that little nose pointing up there. He's hydrodynamic, so he can move through the water with a minimum of energy expended. So again, these guys, um, once they hit the bottom of the ocean, would, would tumble until they oriented themselves to the path of least resistance, which means their nose was pointing back into the current. So trilobites tell us some stories. This guy is uh, an Arctanaris. I watched this guy being prepared at the University of Rochester. This guy is about eight inches long. Um, and he's a grandpa. Uh, we know he's a grandpa because if you look at his back, what looks like might be seashells on his back um, or barnacles on his back, those are actually seashells. Those are uh, inarticulate brachiopods. Those are shells that attach themselves to the back of this guy. So he's kind of gotten as old as he's going to get, as big as he's going to get. And because he didn't molt his exoskeleton much anymore, these shells actually had a chance to attach themselves and ride on his back. Uh, for the rest of his life until he died. Um, those star-looking things, those are crinoid, um, uh, crinoid calyxes and uh, crinoid crowns. But I was lucky enough to watch this guy being prepared. I have one of these guys right now that's 6 and 15 sixteenths of an inch long. It's one of four that come out of that quarry that are in the 7-inch seven uh, size range of trial bites. I've got, I've got one of those in the, in the exhibit as well. These are some of the trial bites that come out of that Caleb's quarry in Middleport, New York. Um, they don't all come out of the same level. They come out of different levels because these levels have been laid down over time. Uh, we don't know exactly the time intervals between each layer, but uh, they are separate layers. So they are all found within a quarry, but they're not all found together. Um, and these are just uh, an example of some of the trial bites that come out of that quarry. Uh, again, very greatly in size and shape. The large Arctanaris get to be about seven or eight inches long. The Trimeris delphinocephalus, the guy in the upper right-hand side, he gets to be about seven or eight inches long. The Radnoria bredi on the other side, he gets to be at most about a half inch long. So again, lots and lots of diversity in size and shape. Uh, this is one of the exhibits uh, of my, uh, one of the components of my exhibit that's in the museum right now. And right there, you can kind of see um, the, the variety of trial bites that, that come out of it and also the size and shape. People ask me, what is your best discovery? And, you know, I can't really tell. Um, back behind me here, I've got a bunch of stuff. I've got a triceratops vertebra. Um, I'm going out to dig uh, triceratops this year in Baker, Montana. Uh, it was found last year. We had to cover it back up because it didn't have enough time to get out of the ground. We're going back this year to get it out of the ground before it gets destroyed. Uh, triceratops is a great discovery. Um, I'm finding armor-plated fish here in Michigan. Uh, those armor-plated fish are quite rare, and I'm happy I'm finding those. But this one was kind of nice. Uh, upper right hand side that's me inside the quarry in Middleport uh, breaking rocks and that close up to the to the right of that one actually shows a trilobite uh, just by my thumb there um, and what it actually was it was two trilobites that I found uh, in the rocks you can see the rocks have broken apart the bottom right hand side you can see that there are some red marks written on that rock those are registration marks for the prep lab so they know how the rocks go back together and then those trilobites can be prepared. And you can see the two trilobites uh, on that rock kind of pointing in the, in the same direction. Well, when the prep guy in the prep lab started cleaning it, he discovered that those trilobites were actually preserved in iron pyrite, in fool's gold. 
those are the trial bites that have, have been prepared and they've got a nice golden color. They've been preserved in fool's gold. Um, that's one of my nicest discoveries right there. I really enjoy that one. Um, I was quite happy when I found that one. These are the ones in Rome, New York, um, the pyrotized trial bites. I'm bringing this up right now because um, we now know that trial bites did lay eggs or they did have eggs. Um, up until now, we had no evidence. You know, did they give birth to live young? Did they have, lay eggs? You know, how did these things grow? Well, because of the exceptional preservation of this site and the technical abilities of the guy who digs them up, we've been able to find these guys had eggs. Those little oval shaped things just uh, under the cephalon there, those are actually trial bite eggs. When these are prepared, they're prepared uh, with an air abrasive, you know, like a mini sandblaster. And you blast a powder at a very, very low pressure to blast away the, the matrix of the rock that surrounds it. If the pressure is too high, it just blows the fool's gold right away. So he's got to be very careful, and meticulous when he cleans it to not blow away the, the, the pyrite. So as he's doing that, he noticed on a lot of the different trial bites, they had clusters of these little oval things just underneath the cephalon. The other creatures on Earth that can do that right now are horseshoe crabs. They have their eggs in a very much the same place as the trilobites have their eggs, those little oval shapes. So again, now we know that at least some of the species of trilobites did have eggs. They did lay eggs. Well, they didn't lay them. They Well, yeah, I guess they laid them, but they tucked them within their body for them to grow. I just got back last week from this place. It's Penn Dixie. It's a... Uh, it's a fossil dig site in New York. Uh, every year in uh, in June, we do something we call dig with the experts. What we do is we go out there with an excavator. We dig up a bunch of rock that's got lots of fossils in it. We dump it in piles around the quarry. And then for two days, we let 200 people a day come in. They pick a pile, sit on that pile, and they break rock open and find lots of trilobites. These are some of the trilobites that can be found at the Pendixi Quarry. Uh, the Bellicart Rydia is a very rare one found. Uh, actually, this weekend, this past weekend, we found a lot of these guys, so not quite that rare. The Elder Jops is by far the most common. Green Ops is one that kind of fits in, in the middle between them. Uh, again, this is in New York. It's just outside of Buffalo. If you are in the mood to travel and you do travel around the country and you like to dig up fossils, uh, every year in June, we do this dig with the experts. The way to find out about that dig is you Google Penn Dixie. It's uh, uh, www.pendixie.org, P-E-N-N-D-I-X-I-E, pendixie.org, and you'll find out all the information you need to, to get out there. Uh, and while you're there, you're like 20, 30 miles, not even 30 miles, you're 20 miles away from Niagara Falls. If you've never seen Niagara Falls, it's a, a really nice place to go visit to see the wonders of nature. One of the seven natural wonders of the world is Niagara Falls. So a great location to go out and find fossils. Uh, uh, I go out there every year. I've been going there for at least two decades now, uh, digging fossils in, in Pendixie. Um, this is part of the program I did for a local club here. Those are just some areas around Michigan where we're able to uh, to dig fossils. I'm uh, up near the thumb, that little uh, yellow uh, star uh, up near Saginaw. That's kind of where I'm from, from Midland. Uh, so I've got some really nice areas nearby here to go dig in fossils. But I still love to go out to U-Dig out, uh, out in Utah. Um, these are some of the fossils that come out of Penn Dixie Quarry the last couple of years. Uh, these are the Elder Jobs trilobites. You can see they've got tremendously curved on the, on the right-hand side there, really um, uh, crescent-shaped eyes. Those bumps on top of the middle of the, of the head section, not really quite sure what they do. Um, they could house sensory organs as well, uh, but that's a really nice trilobite right there. Um, when I was there a couple of years ago, I found these two guys side by side. If you like watching... Oh gosh, the David Attenborough or Richard Atten David David Attenborough, I think um, he's got that uh, program called Blue Planet. There's one specific episode uh, that they do in the Caribbean, and halfway through the episode, they talk about the lobsters walking from warm water into the cold water because it's the change of season and they're protected deeper in, in deeper water. And you see on film, there's a a, tr a lobster leading a pack of about, about five or six lobsters in a row. That first lobster is breaking the current. He's making it easier for the guys behind him to walk. 
I think this guy did the same thing. That lead trilobite was going into the current and breaking the current. And the other guy just wanted a free ride and kind of hooked up behind him so he didn't have to himself break that current to, uh, to move from one location to another. Really like that piece as well. Uh, these, again, are some of the pictures of, of stuff I've got out of there. But, you know, when you find a trilobite, you don't find it looking like this. They're not perfect. They're not gorgeous. They're not absolutely outstanding. You got to work to get them. This is a, a photograph of how this particular trilobite grouping uh, was found. You know, they break out of what's called a bedding plane. You tilt the rock on its end, you tap it, and it starts to crack. Those are bedding planes. Those are layers of sedimentation. As the mud came in and flowed, it just kept flowing and building up. Those are the sedimentation layers, sedimentary layers. And the trilobites would get trapped between those layers. And when you break the rock open, then you see something like this. But then you have to get an air abrasive unit or some sort of tools to get them cleaned out to look like this. So again, you don't find a perfect trilobite in the ground. You got to do a little bit of work to get it. Here's another example right here. That's how I found it. It broke beautifully on a bedding plate. Now that right there, anybody would be happy to put that in their collection. That's a really good looking trilobite. But with a little bit of work, um, sometimes we use pin vices or dental picks to clean them. Most the most the best way to do it, most people use excuse me, an air abrasive unit. And this is what they look like when they're done. So again, you don't find them like that out in the field. When you see them prepared like that, there's been a lot of work that's gone into them. I've got one that's got uh, 57 freestanding spines on it. And that one took 700 hours to prepare. So it's not something that happens, you know, in a couple of minutes, it does take some time. These guys are much easier than that one, but still it takes time to clean these trilobites. This is an example of some of the trilobites from Oklahoma. Uh, again, these all come from one location, not the same layer, several layers within that mountain. And uh, these are some of the bugs that come out of there. The uh, top left-hand picture, that's a Ketneraspis. He's got lots of wonderful spines. He's a, he's a porcupine when he rolls up into a little ball. And same thing with the guy in the bottom right. Um, the guy in the bottom middle, um, that one is a... Uh, uh, Cyphaspis caroli. The guy that's working the mountain has been working it for decades. His name is Bob Carroll, and he found that trilobite right there, and they named it after him. Uh, it's a Cyphaspis caroli, and he's got three freestanding spines, two that come back from the head section from the cephalon, and one coming up from the middle of the thorax, the middle of the body. <clears throat> these are some of the ones you can get over by your neck of the woods. Uh, these come from Utah. Um, that place called Udig, this is a great location to find these trilobites. Um, also, Nevada has a couple locations where you can go. Uh, Pahrump, Nevada is a place where you can find some. Uh, but these are guys that come out of, uh, uh, out of Utah, uh, specifically the Udig quarry. Um, they kind of look a little bit similar, but they are all different species. And again, varying sizes, shapes, various different types of head structures and tail structures. But they are some really cool trilobites that come out of uh, uh, out of Utah. Then other states, we find them from all over. Um, the upper left hand corner, that one comes from Missouri. Uh, the one in the middle comes from Indiana. Uh, I'm sorry, Illinois. The one on the right is Indiana. The middle picture on the left, that was the state fossil of Ohio. Um, the ones on the bottom left, those are Zacanthoides. Those come out of Nevada. The guy in the middle right there on the bottom, that one comes from Utah. And the one on the far right on the bottom, that one comes from Missouri as well. So again, you can see they come from all over the country. We've got trilobites that come out of Delta, Utah, that are the same trilobites we get out of Georgia. Uh, the Conasauga shale. It's the same species of trilobite on two different parts of the country. We don't find them anywhere in the middle, but we find them in Utah, we find them in Georgia. So there are trilobites that can be found almost everywhere. Here's some trilobites from around the world. I don't buy any Moroccan trilobites unless they're unprepared and we prepare them ourselves. Um, the one in the bottom right-hand side, that one is a really cool one, but he has been repaired Remember I said repair is not a problem, but they've got to be uh, repaired correctly and you got to be told that they've been repaired. Um, the one in the upper uh, right hand, uh, I'm sorry, upper left hand side, that one comes from Russia. It's one of the Asafa species. The one in the top center in the middle, um, that one is a Moroccan trilobite and those don't get faked very often because there's no no need to. They're so common. Uh, when you break them in the break them open in the rock, you've got the positive and the negative. They fit back together perfectly. They usually don't fake those. 
the one in the middle of the picture, that one is also a Russian trilobite. Um, the one in the bottom left hand is also a Russian trilobite. Most of these, um, when I get them, I've never been to Russia. I go to the University of St. Petersburg. They have a site there that collects, prepares, and then sells these things. Um, I haven't bought one in years. I don't know if you can even get one now or, uh, because of what's going on. But um, these trilobites are found all over the world. <clears throat> Well, I, let me stop my share here. Uh, I want to thank Marcus Martin, the guy who actually has the property where the uh, gold bugs are found. Uh, he let me go out there and dig up a few of those pyrotized trial bites. And Dr. Sam Gunn, uh, he just retired from the Hawaii Conservancy. Um, he's a trilobitophile. There are no trilobites found in Hawaii, but he lives in Hawaii. He's Hawaiian, and uh, he's just a, a trilobitophile. He loves trilobites. Uh, his, uh, his site is... Uh, trilobites.info if you want to learn more about trilobites so let me stop my share and if you guys have any questions i'll be happy to answer some questions for you uh adrian you are muted so we need to get tom to do that but while you tom is working on unmuting the pack i'm going to ask paleo joe you showed us your favorite one how long did it take to clean the that that, Prep that I, one. It, it didn't take very long at all. It only took about three hours because it had to be glued together, epoxied together. And then once it was epoxy, the air brace have just uh, just cleaned it off in just about an hour or two to get it clean. And yeah, so a lot of, go ahead. No, a lot of them in the shale are very easy to clean. When you get them in limestone, that's what takes a lot longer. The limestone is a lot harder. Uh, we use uh, like baking soda, aluminum oxide, uh, those kind of things. Uh, to, to as the powder to clean those trial bites. You'd be surprised at the pressure that's used. It just blows the matrix away and leaves the fossil behind. Wow, because you just answered that what question that what you used with the air blower. Um, yeah. How big is your air blower when you clean them? I mean, is it like a little little it's nozzle? A or is it... it's, a, it's about the size of a, of a pen, an ink pen. It's got a little hole in one end. Um, it's got a hose going back to a compressor. And there's also a reservoir that holds the powder. And as the air goes through, it picks up the powder and blows it through that nozzle uh, at, a, at a high pressure to, uh, to, to clean the fossil. Okay. Well, I'm going to give Adrian a chance to ask a question before I start rattling off other ones. Okay. Um, I go to a lot of shows and I see the trilobites that have the horns on them. Yep. But a lot of them are from Morocco and they all do, like you said, do look alike. I know they're really good at faking a lot of stuff. Um, but do you, you do find them with the horns attached and everything, you know, that come off of them? Yeah, they got to be cleaned. Um, they, they are found with the horns attached uh, in three dimensional. The best way to do it is get a UV light and shine the UV light on the trilobite. And if there's been any major faking, you'll see it's, it's going to discolor. It's going to be kind of a, it'll glow kind of white or blue. Um, there's several of them, you know, when you, when you shine the light on there, you'll see a crack going through the trial bite and it'll be white. That's okay. It's been repaired and glued back together. If you see like the whole tail section is white or the, the mid part of the mid section is white or the cephalon is white. Those things have been faked. Another way to tell is with destructive testing. The dealer's not going to let you do it, but if you heat up a pin and put a touch a pin to the exoskeleton and it starts to smoke and you start to get a plastic smell, <laughs> then they're fake. But again, they're not gonna let you do that. The best way to tell is using a UV light and shine it across the trial bike to see if it's fake or not. Now there's a lot of good ones out there, but you know, there's an awful lot of fake ones too. Yeah, cause we have a guy from the Ventura club that he, at every meeting, he always uh, brings fossils and he's always got trilobites and everything. And they all have horns, you know, the the, prongs that you were talking about and then at yep. the fair he enters them too and yep. i was just curious if they were real or not yeah um the cost will help tell you if they're real or not um the one that i have it's got 57 freestanding spines is about four thousand dollars um so yeah they, they're expensive but that comes from the hours that one took 700 hours to clean um yeah but the easy way is the the light or the pin, if you can get away with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Oh, we got a question. Uh, can Can you tell by um, by fossil records like how 
heavy their shells were or how strong they were as animals? We can tell sometimes. Um, some of the shells that we find, um, uh, for example, the Arctonaris, the, the one big one that I, I like, their shells are very thin. Um, it all depends on the species, how thick they are. Some trial bites have very, very thin shells. And when you clean them, the shells just break away and they're gone. Uh, the green ops is another one that does. The fake ops, the Eldridge ops trial bites have a really super thick shell and they're much easier to clean. The shells don't break away. So we can tell their thickness of the shell sometimes just by looking at it. Um, and again, how quickly they, they break away. The ones from Nevada, my gosh, those those shells are super thin. Got be very careful when you clean those. <clears throat> have they any? Have, do they have any um, relation to the um, rolling bullies and evolutionarily? Yeah, I, I call trial bites my roly polies. Um, they are both arthropods. Uh, the roly polies, the pill bugs, those are terrestrial. They live on land. Trial bites lived in the oceans. Um, they are arthropods, so they are related. They're cousins, they're distant cousins, but they are related, but they're not the same type of creature. Uh, arthropods, um, uh, there's a huge variety of them. Right now in the oceans, we also have one called an isopod. They live in the very deep oceans. It's really, when you look at it, it looks like a trilobite, but it doesn't have those three lobes. It's just got one major, major shell, but it's got the legs in the middle. It's got the gill branches, it's got a head section, it's got a tail section, but it is a different creature. Yeah, trilobites are all gone, but they are related to pill bugs. Any other questions for Paleo Joe? Well, I always have questions. <laughs> uh, so Paleo Joe, if you went to UDIG, would you consider those trilobites thick shells, thin shells? How easy would it be to clean them once you go there? UDIG has got a lot of thick shelled trilobites. Um, so much so, and the, the matrix is so soft that a lot of people use a, a wire brush, a steel wheeled wire brush on the end of a drill to clean them off. Uh, the shells will remain perfectly intact and the matrix will get uh, washed away, uh, rubbed away by the steel, uh, you know, steel wheel. But what you do there is you'll end up seeing the, the gouges from the steel wheel. Then you may want to take some sandpaper or something and just rub those off. But yeah, those are very, very hard shells, very thick shells. Um, yeah, use a drill and a steel wheel to, to clean them. So I imagine that the New York ones, uh, when you go to the quarry, that it would be limestone that it's in, is the matrix. Would you use a steel wheel to clean out the limestone from the New York uh, that you're no, talking that, about? That one, we uh, we start with, uh, basically, it's a uh, air scribe. It's a, a mini, I guess, a mini jackhammer is what, what, what I can think about. It's, again, about the size of a pen. It's run by compressed air, and you use that like a jackhammer. It's got a, a sharp tungsten carbide needle. It's got a spring inside, and as the air blows that spring or the, the needle forward, the spring pushes it back, so it go, goes very quickly. And we use that to get really close to the exoskeleton. Once we get to the exoskeleton, then we go to the air abrasive unit. And with limestone, uh, the trilobites don't break on bedding planes because limestone breaks and cracks all different shapes and sizes. What you'll see is when you break the rock open, you'll actually see the profile of a trilobite. And you got to know enough that, okay, now I got to cut that away and glue it back together and prep it uh, from that. So again, limestone is very difficult to get it out of. Shale is super easy. So how big are the ones in the, in the New York one and how big are the ones in, tri in Utah generally? Utah, we get anywhere between one inch and uh, usually about two inches uh, average. I mean, you'll get bigger ones than that if you get lucky, but usually one to two inches is good. Uh, the New York ones, uh, Elder Jops, we get them. We just left that one quarry. Again, one to two inches. Uh, if we go to the Middleport quarry, they go all the way up to seven inches, very by species. Wow. And then when you're talking about the Ohio quarry where they're all rolled up, how big are the rolled up? trilobite generally in that in that area found the the entire rolled up trilobite is about a half inch uh a half inch in diameter uh but there's another location that's the same type of trilobite those are usually about two to three inches in diameter so again it shows us that the one area is probably much uh uh, much shallower and that's where the littler ones are found and the deeper water had much larger ones 
I know, I probably know the answer, but do they ever find trilobites with other animals? I know you had the uh, picture with the cephalopod with it, but do you ever find a lot of trilobites with other things? Oh, absolutely, all the time. Again, most of the time when we find trilobites, we, we're looking at a storm deposit. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't be buried and, and preserved as fossils. When you think about fossils, they're really actually pretty rare uh, to find complete fossils because everything on Earth is going to decay away. The, the, the environmental conditions have to be perfect in order to create a fossil. So what happens when we get these large storm events, everything in that ecosystem gets destroyed and, and moved around and buried. So often we do find lots of other creatures. The Middleport Quarry is a best example of it. Um, if you go to my Facebook page uh, lately, I've been posting some of the uh, fossils from the Middleport Quarry, and I've got cystoids and crinoids and, and uh, graptolites all on one block, because again, that whole ecosystem was buried together at once, and that we do find multiple, uh, multiple genre on one block. Hmm. Well, I know that I could ask a lot of questions, but I'm going to go back to AU, Adrian, to see if anyone else has thought of any questions. Anybody, burning desire. Last chance to talk to Paleo Joe. Joe, um, what, do you, is there a way of getting more information on the location in California? Um, yeah, uh, send me an email, uh, paleojoe at charter.net, and I'll send that out to you. I don't have it handy. I'll have to go look it up. That's fine. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, if you guys, if you guys want to, uh, my my YouTube, I have a YouTube channel. On there, I do show you um, how we clean some of the Green River fish from Kemmerer, Wyoming. I've got uh, videos there that talk about what crinoids are, what trilobites are, little primers, no longer than 10 to 15 minutes long. Uh, my Facebook is uh, uh, Paleo Joe. Uh, if you want to you know, jump on my Facebook page, I've only got like four or five more friends that I can take, but you can like and follow me uh, and my page. Um, I've got a website, paleojoe.com. I've got TV shows and radio shows and uh, teacher resources and stories and all that kind of stuff on my website. I also have a, a fossil store there if anybody's interested. So uh, that one is paleojoe.com. So um, yeah, lots of information on the website and my Facebook and my YouTube. All right, I have one last question. Are you married? Yeah. Oh, wow. Do you ever see your family? No. <laughs> okay, just check it. <laughs> no, really, uh, it's a it's a good question because uh, summer is my busy time. Uh, I just got back from um, the dig in New York, and tomorrow I'm actually going in for surgery. On Saturday, I'm leaving, leading a, a fossil dig up in Alpena, and I come back and it just go all, it starts all over again. I'm I'm doing uh, lectures uh, down in Detroit. I've got a uh, another program, and I'm, I'm off the top of my head right now. I, I don't have my calendar, but I've got another program uh, not that far away. I'm on the road a lot, so yeah, she's happy. She, she's happier that way. <laughs> I, I figured as much. <laughs> All right. Well, great. Thank you so much. Oh, one last oh, question. Oh, Joe. Never mind. Do you have a fossil named after you? No, I don't. But really exciting thing this last two weeks, um, we did find some fossils in that Middleport quarry. They're, uh, they're echinoderms. They're related to modern day uh, starfish. Um, they're called uh, uh, carpoids. And two of the diggers there found a brand new genus, never before been discovered. Um, I've never found one brand new one. I find a bunch of rare stuff, but I've never found a new, a new species. Well, keep digging, you might. I, well, I've got one now that, you, now that you're talking about. It. I did find a fish that I'm not quite sure uh, is not a new species. Uh, I'm working with a guy who's a uh, uh, armor-plated fish specialist, and we're going to see him in a couple of weeks. He's going to look at it. But I think it's a new species because it's different than the other ones that, that are there. And if it's a new species, I hope I get to name it. Oh, there you go. I hope you get it. I hope you get it. All right, you guys. You guys ready for the meeting? Well, thank you. And uh, Paleo Joe, I understand you may be wanting to sign off, but thank you again. Not a problem. Thank you. Yep, thank take you. care. Okay. Thank you so much, Joe. Have a good night. Good night.